Yo koso owashitare. Welcome back to another story. And right off the top, I just want to say this story, like the previous one, is going to be a two-parter. It's just a little too long to handle in one video. I would like to not have a video be 45 minutes long. So, two parts. This is part one. And let's waste no more time and just get right on into this story. Once upon a time, Imawa Mukashi. There was a man who was the former governor of the province of Tango. And his name was Takashina no Toshihira no Ason. The Ason, however, was not actually part of his name. It was a an office in government. It was his position. So he was a nobleman. He was fairly high-ranking, not the highest-ranked nobleman, as you will see, but a high-ranking nobleman. But the thing about our boy, he was not a nobleman for that long. And in fact, this story begins after he has entered the Buddhist priesthood and become a Buddhist priest, specifically a novice or a nyudo is the word that they use in the actual story. New meaning to enter, meaning somebody who is new, and do meaning the way, the path, specifically in this instance, the path of Buddhism. But because he was from Tango, he was known as Tango Nyudo, the novice of Tango, Tango Nyudo. But I have to apologize to you guys, because though I'm offering a huge explanation to this man, who he is, who his name is, where he's from, the story's not about him. It's actually about his younger brother, who we do not know. We don't know his name. His name was lost to time. In this original story, in whatever original text it was on, the name was either torn out, somehow, or illegible. In one way, shape, or form, we just do not know who this man's younger brother was. So I'm going to take the liberty and call him Brad. And I'm going to call him Brad because Brad was a bit of a bum. Brad the bum. Brad was a nobleman. You know, he had noble blood, so he had some privilege in society. But he had no job. He didn't really do anything. He was just kind of there. Thus, Brad the bum. But the thing about Brad and his older brother, who is actually an accomplished individual, the Tango Nyudo, both of these men served a man by the name of Fujiwara no Sanainari. And the thing about the Fujiwara at this time is they were the top dogs. Their clan was the number one clan. Okay, they were actually the number two clan technically because the number one clan is the imperial family. But these guys were number two. They were the undisputed masters. They controlled so much more land than everybody. They had their members married into the imperial family. The Fujiwara were it. They were the top dogs. And so the Tango Nyudo and our boy Brad both served this man Fujiwara no Sanenari. Fujiwara no Sanenari was actually the head director, the head executive, I guess you could say, of a place called the Dazaifu. He was the Sochi, is the specific kanji that they use. And the Sochi was the head of the Dazaifu. What's the Dazaifu? The Dazaifu was like a government outpost in Kyushu. Kyushu being the most westerly island in all of Japan. And the reason why they had a special outpost out there was because it was so far away from the capital that controlling the lands out there was kind of a pain but also because it wasn't that long ago that they had actually just finished subjugating the people of southern Kyushu and bringing them into the fold of the Japanese imperial state. Also, Kyushu was the island that was closest to the mainland. It was the closest island to Korea and, by extension, the closest island to China. And there was concern for many, many years that there may eventually be an invasion from the mainland into Japan. And just in case, just in case, we want a military government outpost on Kyushu just to keep things under wraps, just in case. But the thing about the Dazaifu is because of its positioning and because it had close ties with the government, it ended up attracting a lot of foreigners, a lot of mainlanders. Because even though there was no invasion from the mainland, people wanted to trade. The Japanese were interested in Chinese goods, Korean goods. The Koreans and Chinese are less so interested in Japanese goods, but they, you know, there was still trade. And so one day, when Fujiwara no Sanenari went out to the Dazaifu, went out to Kyushu to do whatever duties that he was going to do, he brought along Tango no Nyudo and his younger brother, Brad, our main character. And they were hanging out at the Dazaifu, and while they were staying there, Brad was out and about one day, and he ran into a Chinese man. And this was no normal Chinese man. He wasn't just some traitor who was there to make a quick buck. This was a very wise individual, very learned individual. And he was skilled in the art of san. Now, what is san, you may ask? San, as you can see from the kanji here, essentially it's a little bit hard to explain, but san kind of means something to the effect of counting or arithmetic or bringing numbers together. 
Like you see it in modern Japanese use of words like sansu, which means arithmetic, literally san, which is like counting, and then su is numbers. Or you have keisan, which is what you, is a reckoning or a, a final accounting of the cost of a thing. And so san kind of has this connotation of counting. But the other thing that they don't tell you in modern Japanese classes is that it also had a sort of magical feel to it. Like the skill of sun specifically in this case referred to the use of these little divination sticks I guess you could say. They had things written on them and depending on how you placed them you could do all sorts of spells and and fancy techniques that, that boggled the mind as you will see. But anyway this Chinese man was very very skilled in this arcane mathematic geometry magic wizardry whatever the heck it is. And our boy Brad really wanted to learn this. And so he met this Chinese guy and thought to himself, huh, I gotta get him to teach me how to do some of these things. And so he approached this man and said, hey, sir, uh, please teach me your ways. And at first the Chinese guy was just not interested. Like this some country bumpkin from some backwoods country that's no, nowhere near as cool as my country. And, and San isn't even well known around these parts. So like, who cares? And I've got b better things th to do than to entertain some little kid's fantasies about learning magic. Like I've got other things to do, whatever. However, he did think that he, the kid at least deserved a chance. So he said, okay, you know what, whatever. You want to learn this stuff, just go ahead, show me what you have learned if you are that interested. You probably know a thing or two, just, just show me what you got. And this Chinese guy wasn't expecting much. But our boy Brad actually did know a thing or two about it, and he had a lot of potential. And in doing a little bit of this son himself, he showed this Chinese man that he was no joke. He knew what he was doing to some degree. And the Chinese man was very impressed. And he said, wow, you're really good at this. Man, you're so good at this. You really should learn this. You should become someone like me. And I, wow, it's just a shame that you were born here of all places. I mean, this stuff is known nowhere in your country, unfortunately. So I have a proposition for you. I would be happy to teach you the ways of Sun, but in exchange, I would like you to come back to my home country of China, at the time it was the Song Dynasty, and study it more there. Become one of my disciples and help me out. And Brad, was excited at this idea. He really wanted to learn something new. He was, oh, cool, best opportunity. Got to take this, grab this by the horns. And so he told the Chinese guy, you know what, sir? I would love to do that. That would be amazing. And even if you can make me even just a little bit better at this skill, I would be happy to go to China with you. At least that's what he said. But here's the thing about Brad the bum. When you're a bum, you get really, really good at buttering people up and telling them what they want to hear so you can get what you want out of them. And that's exactly what Brad was doing here. He didn't actually want to go to China. <laughs> that's a pain in the butt. Also, that journey is actually really dangerous. People die on that journey all the time. And who wants to go to a new country and learn a whole new language and deal with all of that stuff? Ooh, ooh, that's a pain. No, 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 no. But Brad did want to learn these skills. And clearly this Chinese guy was a little bit skeptical about Brad hanging out. You know, he was a little worried that Brad wasn't the most honest and trustworthy of individuals. So he clearly wanted Brad to come with him to China, not only so he could teach him more thoroughly, but also because he wasn't entirely sure Brad was on board. And this was one way to make sure that he was entirely on board. But even though he had a little bit of skepticism, the Chinese man was convinced. And he began to teach Brad some of the basics of this magic system. And Brad picked it up like a genius. He was a prodigy at this. The specific phrase that appears in the actual story is that when this Chinese man taught Brad one thing, Brad could glean 10 things from that one truth. And so even after teaching him just a little bit, this Chinese guy was even more blown away. And he told Brad, whoa, not only are you just good at this, but even in my country where there are sanjutsu practitioners, sanjutsu is another term for this, sanjutsu practitioners everywhere. I've never met anybody as good as you. Holy cow, dude, you're a natural. You really need to come to China with me. Like again, nobody in this land of Japan knows anything about this stuff. It would be such a waste to see your skills just not utilized to their full extent. You have to come back with me, bro. You have to, like seriously, that would be the worst waste in human history if you didn't come learn from the professionals in my home country of China. And Brad just kept up the facade. Oh yeah, 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 totally, bro. I totally get you and I'm looking forward to that. Yes, I so will go with you to China. I can't, I have to, I have to. 
I have to. Like, I, th that's the only option there is for me. I've got it. I understand. And as some time went on and Brad began learning more and more of these skills, the master started now expounding a little bit more on the things that you could do with this magic, this magic math. <laughs> and he told Brad, you know, doing these things, there are even skills whereby you can heal the sick and even get rid of your enemies. Those who want to do you harm and who have no love for you. In fact, this skill set that I'm teaching you, the concepts behind it, are just a reflection of the greater truth of everything. Everything in existence is tied back to these sticks and represented by these sticks. And so the things that you could do with this skill set is immeasurable. You could do so much with it, especially in the hands of someone as capable as you. There are no limits to what you could do. However, before I start getting into some of these deeper concepts and these deeper teachings, I'm not going to be happy with you just saying that you're going to come to China with me. You have to swear to me. Swear to me that you will come with me to China. Now, some of you may be thinking like, bro, okay, we get it. You keep saying the same thing over and over again. But this is just to show that this Chinese guy didn't fully trust Brad. He knew. And the writers of the story trying to emphasize that like Brad was a flaky guy. You couldn't trust him. And he had all of these times, all of these times where somebody came to him, bro, are you for sure? Are you sure? Promise, 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 promise. And so Brad is giving his word every single time. And so even now, the Chinese man said, swear to me, pledge that you will come with me to China. And Brad simply said, yes, sir. I, I swear to you, I will go with you to China when we are ready to depart. But of course, deep down in his heart, Brad was not concerned with going to China. He had no intention to do so. But he had now heard that there was the ability to heal the sick and to destroy one's opponents. And he wanted to know that. But the Chinese man was not entirely without wit. He understood that this man he was dealing with may not be the most trustworthy of individuals. So he told him, well, Brad, I've taught you many things and I have much more to teach you. However, when it comes to some of these more deeper principles, like the slaying of one's enemies, I will not teach you any of that until we are on the boat on our way to China. Until then, I'm just going to stick with these basic things and these more accessible techniques. So please don't get your hopes up too much. As soon as we set out for China and we are on the boat and on our way there, I will teach you literally everything I have that I know. And so the Chinese man went on teaching Brad for I don't know how long, maybe several days, it doesn't actually say. But enough time had passed that Fujiwara no Sanenari was suddenly summoned back to the capital. Apparently there was some sort of an incident at a temple called Annakuji. And in one of the sources that I read, it mentioned that there was actually some sort of historical thing that happened. There was a, an infighting between clan members or something like that. I don't remember what the details were, but it was some kind of a disturbance that actually happened. And Fujiwara no Sanenari, Brad and Brad's older brother's boss, suddenly had to go back to the capital to represent his interests, to defend his interests. Whatever was going on was a big deal, and he had to split ASAP. And when the boss leaves, everyone is supposed to follow him. That includes the Tango Nudo and Brad. And so Brad began making preparations to leave. And the Chinese man saw this and instantly became suspicious and nervous. And he came to Brad and said, whoa, 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 whoa. Bro, where do you think you're going? You're not trying to get out of coming to China with me, are you? You said you would come with me. We, I'm, I'm not planning on sticking around much longer. We're going to be leaving in not too long. You can't go up to the capital. You can't do this. You can't leave me. And Brad just looked at him and said, Look, sir, I, I, I understand your reservations about this, but this is my lord we are talking about. This is my boss. All of the societal expectations of both Japan and China, the Confucian teachings, all of these things all say that I should be there for my lord. That is who I work for. That is who I owe my very being to. I have to go to the capital with him. It's out of my hands. It's not my choice. I would love to go to China with you, but I can't afford that right now. My lord needs me. Surely you, a man so wise and esteemed as you, can understand that. And hearing this, the Chinese man thought about it. And you know, from an East Asian moral framework, he had a point. You were supposed to be there for your lord. If your lord needed your service and he rewarded you great and he was a good lord to you, which apparently Fujiwara no Sanenari was, you were supposed to help him. If he needed your services, he needed your services. And it was your duty to provide. And so this Chinese man simply stroked his chin 
He thought about it and said, you know what? You have a point. You have a point. So here's the deal. You should go with your Lord and help him out. But as soon as you get done with whatever you need to do, as soon as you get done with what you need, you should come back here. You need to come back here because we are planning on leaving here pretty soon and you have to come to China with me. You swore. You swore and it would be a massive waste if you didn't come with us. So go, perform your duties, and then come back here. I will wait. I will put off our departure until you return. But make it quick. Do what you gotta do. And once more, Brad swore, I'll be back, I'll be back. And then he went off with his lord and his older brother back to the capital. Now the funny thing was, is that Brad had no intentions of coming back. He did not care. And as soon as he got into the capital, instantly all his attention and all his focus was stolen by his friends, his family, his other connections in the capital. Everybody had some sort of obligation that they had now put on Brad. And so even though the words, yes, I will go to China with you, fell out of his mouth so easily, it wasn't actually that easy. And somehow this information even made it to Brad's older brother, the Tango Nudo. And when he heard this, he came to Brad and said, I heard that you were planning on going back to Kyushu and running off with some Chinese guy back to China. That is absolutely unacceptable. You cannot go. We need you here. You've got too many obligations here. You can't go. And I'm assuming, this the story doesn't tell us, but I'm assuming that Brad simply said, well, you know, I wasn't actually planning on going back anyway. I got what I wanted from that guy. And so, of course, time passed and time passed. Brad never showed up. Brad never left the capital. And the Chinese man was left there in Kyushu waiting and waiting and waiting. Without a single word. No word from the capital. No word from Brad. No, hey, don't worry. I, I'm a little bit behind schedule. I'm sorry, but I promise I'll be there. Nothing. And so now the Chinese man started to get nervous. And so he sent a messenger to the capital himself. He said, go find Brad, deliver him this message. What's taking you so long? What's going on? What's happening? And the messenger arrived at the capital, safe and sound, found Brad and asked him this question. What are you doing? The Chinese guy is waiting for you. Why are you still hanging out here? And Brad, suddenly being caught off guard, looked at this messenger and went, uh, well, so, uh, so uh, my parents, my, my parents are actually really, really old. And uh, they, they've not been doing so well. Yeah, yeah, they've not been doing very well. And in fact, it's very likely that they're going to pass away in the next day or two, maybe even tomorrow. I, I, I don't know, but they are they are really not doing well. And, and it is my Confucian duty to be there for my parents as, as they pass away. So unfortunately, my hands are tied. I, 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 I can't leave them. And so the messenger went back to the Chinese man with this message. Brad is not coming back. And at this point, the Chinese man knew I've been had. This guy swore to me over and over and over again that he would come to China with me, that he would be my disciple, and that then I could teach him everything that I knew. But he got enough from me, didn't he? I taught him enough. And he snapped his fingers in frustration and he cursed. But not just like the curses that we say. No, 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 no. This was a man of power. He actually cursed Brad. Then and there, using the very skills that he had kept hidden from Brad, he cursed him, and then he sailed off to China. The story doesn't go into detail on what the curse did to Brad, but it does say that Brad, even though he was kind of a lazy, no good freeloader, Brad was rather clever and sharp of wit. He was a smart guy. As you can see, he tricked a very intelligent man out of magical information. And yet, not many days after the Chinese man left for China, Brad's mental ability started to fall. He started to misplace his words. He started to say things that didn't really make sense. And he would occasionally just stop and stare off into space. No expression. Like there wasn't a thought going through his head. And this caused all sorts of problems. I mean, yeah, technically Brad didn't have an actual government position or a job, but he still helped out. Again, he was needed by the people in the capital. And so this sudden change in him, of him becoming strangely incompetent and witless, there was a problem. And Brad was actually rather embarrassed by it too. And to his chagrin, he eventually became so incompetent that he couldn't be in the regular world with normal people. And you know what happens to incompetent, useless noblemen? They get thrown into the Buddhist priesthood. And so that's what Brad did. He became a Buddhist priest. And he eventually moved in on his older brother's temple complex and lived with his older brother till the end of his days. Now I say the end of his days, but don't think for a second that that's the end of this story. This is only part one, remember. There's some other things that are going to happen in the next story 
that will round out the story of Brad, the useless, now Buddhist priest. So, this already has gone on long enough, so we're going to end it here. Again, since it's only part one of one big story, there is no end, thus is it said. So, if you want to know more about what's going to happen, you want to be here for part two, please subscribe to the channel, and if you did like this video, please like it, and please share it with your friends. Share it with your weeb friends, share it with your history friends, your story-loving friends, or just your regular friends. Share it with everybody. But that's going to be it for now. I thank you for listening. Ito katejike no koso haberikere. And hopefully we will see you here for part two in about a week. Adios.